Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mark Andrews, and I'm the technical editor of Silicon Semiconductor Magazine, a publication of Angel Business Communications. Our webinar today will delve into considerations affecting thin film deposition processes, as well as the choices that manufacturers have when selecting deposition tools that fit their present and their future ambitions. In part of the presentation, we will explore some of the insights about thin film processes and deposition equipment that were gained from an industry survey conducted amongst global semiconductor manufacturers just last month. One can't ask for fresher data or more practical insights. And after today's presentation, we will take questions posed by listeners. If we cannot address a question live, we will respond by email after the webinar is completed. Our webinar presenter today is Dr. David Douglas. David is the Senior Product Manager at Denton Vacuum, where he puts more than 30 years experience in thin film deposition and laser industries to work on behalf of Denton's many customers. David has filled a variety of development and technical marketing roles throughout his career, including 15 years in capital equipment. He earned his doctorate in physics from the University of Virginia and has extensive knowledge of thin film and laser technologies utilized across compound semiconductor manufacturing. Please join me today in welcoming David Douglas. Thank you, Mark, and welcome everyone to this webinar on thin film deposition considerations for compound semiconductor manufacturing. As Mark mentioned, I'm with Denton Vacuum. A little bit about Denton Vacuum before we get started. We've been involved in, in manufacturing thin film deposition equipment since uh, pretty much the beginning of the semiconductor uh, age, since uh, over 50 years now. And we focus on improving manufacturing yields for our customers, gaining efficiencies and throughputs, and helping you achieve repeatable performance over a wide process window. I took a rather daunting topic here when talking about compound semiconductors because they cover such a broad spectrum of both mature and emerging applications, ranging from light-emitting diodes, laser diodes, infrared detectors, RF filters, and power amplifiers, as well as some more futuristic applications involving supercomputing and quantum dots. They have a wide range of production levels. Uh, the ones that are mature enough for actual production, ranging from a few runs per day to hundreds per hour. However, when you look at the thin film deposition um, uh, fabrication steps, there's a number of common considerations among them. One, you need consistent results. Uh, that's a must-have for any, any kind of production. Two, you need reliable equipment. Uh, you need your equipment to actually produce the, uh, the, the uh, product you need uh, with a minimum of fuss and bother. Uh, three, you need the lowest cost of ownership, regardless of production level, matched to your production level and your CapEx budget. And finally, you need a proper selection of the in situ controls that ensure production process control and repeatability that are uh, some of the keys for, for, for your uh, production needs. Uh, as Mark mentioned, we have some very fresh survey results, which I'm going to share. I pulled a few key key elements out of the survey that I think really speak well to this webinar, and, and we're going to really flesh these out through the course of the webinar, uh, the themes that, that we, we found in this survey. First, when we look at key challenges in the business environment, we asked, what is your current prediction for revenue growth in 2019, as well as what is your current prediction for revenue growth in 2029? Uh, and you see we have moderate growth to uh, high growth generally predicted for 2019 and optimistically high growth uh, for the next decade. This matches pretty well with market surveys that are, that are top down. Uh, this is bottom up asking individual managers and engineers uh, what they expect. And this matches well with the expectations from the semiconductor uh, market as a whole. So we expect high growth at, uh, over the next decade. At the same time, we asked about what is true of your CapEx budget for 2019. We asked, is it being cut? Is it being increased? Is it being spent on other needs? Uh, and generally, people are, are seeing that they're uh, declining to flat. So we have a combination of high growth expectations over the next decade, but declining CapEx budgets for the next year. So somehow we have to manage through this disconnect so we really need to focus on maximizing CapEx efficiency and getting the most bang for the buck. 
The next thing we asked about was on the technology side, uh, when we uh, we asked about a number of, of uh, technology challenges and, what, and ranking them on a scale of one to seven, from one being least critical to seven being most critical, and we asked about process control, process capability, yield, uptime, repeatability, and ease of installation. And repeatability really jumped out from all the answers as, as the uh, definitely the highest concern and the most critical aspect of any uh, production equipment uh, across the board, regardless of production level. At the same time, we asked about uh, uh, current thin film deposition solutions in the market. We asked, do they provide the in-situ controls and sources you need? And surprisingly, a majority of people said no, uh, a small majority, uh, about 55 to 45. So people don't have the, con uh, the, the confidence in available controls that provide the repeatability that they're, they're denoting as the highest uh, concern. So we'll delve into that a little more today. So you need to make sure you outfit your tools with the proper controls in order to get that repeatability, and we'll try and educate you a little bit on some of the controls that are available and when to use which one. So I'm going to do this by going through a few case studies at different production levels. So first we'll start with a low-throughput emerging application, cooled IR detectors. Uh, these are low-throughput now. They're moving from primarily defense-related industries to more commercial applications. Uh, currently, they're in uh, pilot production, I would call it, and they have a throughputs of few wafers per day. So this is definitely one of our low throughput applications. Second, we'll talk about a medium throughput, which is both the mature and emerging application, diode lasers. Diode lasers are finding their way, have been around for decades, and we have large existing applications, for example, telecom amplifiers for subsea communications and, and above-ground communications. Uh, as well as emerging applications. Uh, facial recognition on a smartphone, for example, uses, uses lasers. So that's a, a new large volume application for lasers, and there's, there's many more coming. And finally, we'll talk about a throughput, a uh, high throughput mature application, RF amplifiers. Uh, RF amplifiers are used in all radio transceivers, and there's multiple transceivers per cell phone. So these are used uh, ubiquitously in consumer products. And we're going to talk through uh, an actual application, a customer application for each one of those, those uh, cases. David, at this time, we uh, wanted to break away and uh, uh, invite our listeners to tell us what utilization levels that they are experiencing and, and, and what day-to-day -day life is in their particular industrial environment. So uh, for those who would like to reply, uh, leave your replies in the box underneath the presentation window on your screen. And our question is simply, what is your target throughput for your deposition equipment? And choose, please, one of the following. A, low volume throughput, which is a few wafers per day. B, medium throughput, a few hundred wafers per day. Or C, high throughput, thousands of wafers per day. Again, please leave your replies in the box underneath the presentation window, and we'll uh, talk more about these results at a future point. David? Thank you, Mark. Uh, so while you're answering that question in your chat box, uh, I'd like to move on and talk about the, the palette, if you will, the, the system options in our toolbox for coming up with uh, production equipment. What do we have available to choose from? I'll talk a bit about the different deposition technologies available, thin film uh, physical vapor deposition technologies, uh, as well as some in situ controls, which give you the repeatability you need, and various front end options, which really address the throughput requirements you may, may have. So I'd like to start with the, th the thin film uh, physical vapor deposition technologies available. And here I've listed the, the primary four technologies available, uh, basically in order of, of uh, ease of use and complexity on the technology level. So we start with thermal resistive evaporation, uh, then E-beam evaporation, magnetron sputtering, and ion beam sputtering. So 
and then I have different properties listed across the top. So thermal resistive evaporation is useful for a few different materials with low melting points. Uh, examples are gold and indium. Uh, indium we'll be talking about quite a bit later. As far as uniformity is concerned, thermal evaporation is inherently poor uniformity, but you can use your system design using planetary fixtures and masks to achieve excellent uniformity, so that's not a real limitation. Impurity levels tend to be high because you're melting and thermally evaporating. Whatever's in your, in your crucible is going to end up in your film. Uh, film quality tends to be poor in terms of density, uh, and you tend to have uh, moderate stress. Density and stress go hand in hand, so you, uh, the ideal would be a, a high-density, low-stress film, but that's, that's difficult to achieve. Uh, so here you get low-density films, which is fine for many applications, and relatively high deposition rates. Temperatures are low with, with uh, evaporation, so you don't have to worry about cooling too much. And good directionality, which means you can use this for, uh, you, you get collimated deposition and can be used for liftoff processes. Scalability is pretty limited with thermal evaporation. Basically, you can put more wafers in your evaporator and go to bigger batch size. That's really your only means of scaling thermal evaporation. And the cost and complexity is very low, so these tend to be less expensive systems. E-beam evaporation is useful, useful on a wider variety of materials. You can evaporate, you can melt anything with a suitably powerful electron beam, so it's useful on metals as well as dielectrics. Again, same uniformity uh, constraints, inherently poor coming out of the crucible, but with a planetary fixture and mass, you can achieve excellent uniformity. Uh, in this case, you tend to get low impurities because you can evaporate just the sample of interest, uh, the, the source material of interest, and you don't get everything coming from everywhere. Film quality is similar to thermal evaporation. It tends to be low-density um, films. Uh, you can improve that with ion assist, and you get moderate stress. You can get very high deposition rates here, so it's very common for thick films to use E-beam evaporation, and this is very common in the optical industry. Temperatures, again, stay, stay very controlled below 100 C, so you don't need extra cooling generally. And again, useful for liftoff applications, very directional beams. Scalability, again, limited. You don't have automation. You have bigger batch sizes. Um, cost and complexity, moderate. The E-beam sources are more complex than a thermal resistive source, um, but not particularly challenging once you, you're familiar with them. Moving on to magnetron sputtering, you can use this with metals and dielectrics again. You get good uniformity. You can improve that uh, with some difficulty uh, or extra cost by going to larger cathodes and some other tricks you can play. Uh, so there's trade-offs to achieve good, uh, better uniformity. Um, impurity levels tend to be low. Film quality is very good. You get very dense films. They're useful for a wide variety of, of uh, uh, products and processes, and you get moderate to high stress. So again, you have to ma manage that stress versus the density and, and come up with the right, uh, right film for your application. Uh, deposition rates tend to be on the lower side, particularly for dielectrics. Um, temperatures tend to be on the higher side, so you often need cooling with this. Uh, 200C could be too hot, especially if you're depositing on a photoresist or a, a polymer substrate. So you might require cooling of your substrate during deposition. And sputtering, magnetron sputtering is relatively low directional uh, technology, uh, so not so good for liftoff unless you use a system geometry that, that gives you that directionality. Scalability is excellent. We have many tools, which we'll go over a little bit later, to, to scale this with automation. Uh, and the cost of complexity, and complexity tends to be high cost, moderate complexity, but very good bang for the buck here for high volume systems. And finally, our, our most complex technology would be ion beam sputtering. You can use any material again for ion beam sputtering, and you get excellent uniformity, very low impurities, the highest density films. This is used when you really have uh, exceptional film requirements on density high stress, which you need to manage, and again, very low deposition rates. And with a low deposition rate comes low temperature, but 
excellent directionality, which you can control um, through the system architecture, uh, but low scalability and very high cost and complexity. So this is the, the technology of last resort when nothing else works. It's slow and expensive, but gives you a quality that can't be beat by any other technology. So when would you, what, what are the considerations we're going to discuss as we move through our toolbox? So let's talk about the technology selection considerations that we'll use in our examples later. So if you're talking about CapEx, then you're going to be looking at cost and complexity. So if that's your main driver, this is the column we're going to, we're going to go down to. Uh, when we're talking about yield, we primarily mean uniformity. A film quality is also a driver of yield, but if you've chosen the right technology to meet your film requirements, then uniformity is going to be the, the primary driver of, of yield. Throughput, you see we have dep rate, deposition rate, as well as scalability. So magnetron sputtering, while it has a low dep rate compared to e-beam evaporation, with the high automation and scalability, you can achieve much higher throughputs in a magnetron system versus an e-beam system for a comparable footprint, if you will. And finally, film quality. This is often the, the key driver. You want to slide down as far as you need and, and not too much further unless you need the scalability. So whatever film quality is required, you're going to have to use the, the cheapest technology that gives you that, that film quality. And by cheapest, I mean the one that's most relevant to your production level. Now let's move on to in situ process controls and diagnostics. I'll just go through four that we have available at, at Denton Vacuum. Uh, the first is plasma emission monitor. The plasma emission monitor is actually an optical measurement of the ion species that are in the magnetron plasma that's doing the actual sputtering from your target. This is used uh, in, with a pulse DC uh, power supply to give reactive sputtering. So reactive sputtering means you have a metal target that you're sputtering in an oxygen atmosphere, for example. So you deposit um, aluminum or silicon or tantalum metal, a silicon semiconductor, in an oxygen atmosphere, and when it grows on a substrate, it's the oxide of that. So you, you would have tantalum oxi pentoxide, for example, that you're growing with this uh, right amount of oxygen in the system. If there's too much oxygen, the target will become insulating, and if there's not enough oxygen, the film quality is degraded and it becomes metallic. So you need just the right amount of oxygen in that plasma emission in that plasma. So this plasma emission monitor measures it and controls the oxygen flow in real time. And the advantage of this is it gives you excellent film quality on the substrates at near metal deposition rates. So the metals will deposit much faster than RF sputtering of dielectrics. And so that gives you a much higher throughput should you need it. Uh, so that's a process control. Another process control is, is optical monitoring systems. These are used for precision control of optical film thickness. So if you have an optically transparent film, you can measure the optical thickness in real time, and you can adjust the deposition time for minor variations in the deposition rate and operating conditions and give more reproducible and repeatable end products. And for multi-layer stacks, it's particularly important because any errors you have in this thickness adds up layer by layer. And so for precision optical filters, for example, you can have several hundred layers. And if you have a consistent uh, small error in one direction that you haven't corrected for, uh, you're going to end up with the wrong uh, optical filter. And you can see an example here on, on the right uh, of of the kind of repeatability. I don't know if everybody can read that, but that's 0.3% random error for this particular seven-layer bandpass filter that we uh, use in our paper that this is taken from. Another monitoring system available, the technology available, is quartz crystal monitors. These, again, give you real-time control of thickness, but this is physical film thickness. This is your only choice for optically opaque materials, uh, but for optically transparent materials, you can control the physical thickness, not the optical thickness. It's lower precision optically, but also lower cost. So you can see for this bandpass filter, we had 1.5% random error as opposed to 0.3 with the OMS. If that's good enough, you don't need an OMS, and you don't want to pay for that. Finally, 
We can provide in situ ellipsometers and reflectometers. These are very interesting diagnostics for uh, con uh, monitoring curvature, stress, reflectivity during your process or, or between wafers. Very excellent feedback for statistical process control rather than real time process control, but really a powerful technique should you really have strong uh, demands on curvature, stress, and uh, other optical properties that aren't film based, um, individual thin film based per se. So those are the, uh, some of the tools we'll be, we'll be using in our toolbox. And then I, I next want to talk about uh, front-end options. So we'll just talk about sputtering front-end configurations. Uh, your choice is really determined by your throughput requirement. So here I've shown a, a standard sputter module. It has a number of, of cathodes and diagnostics in it. It's compatible with all front-end options that we offer. Uh, one option is no front-end. You can vent the system, open the lid, put a wafer in here, close the lid, pump it down, and when you achieve your process vacuum, uh, then you can, you can run your wafer in, and you can run that way. The next level of automation is the single chamber, single wafer load port. In this option, you pump down a single wafer uh, through the load port, and then a robotic arm will place the wafer into the chamber through a slip valve. The slip valve isolates the load port from the chamber, and you can pump down only the load port. The next level of throughput would be a single chamber cassette load par port. So instead of this single, ch single wafer load port, you'd have a cassette of up to 25 wafers attached to a single sputter module. And in this case, instead of uh, loading one at a time, you would load a cassette of 25 wafers and pump down this volume. And then you can do one at a time with the robotic arm that's in this, in this extension here. It would load one wafer at a time, sputter, and then you're only paying to pump down this once every 25 wafers. So that gives you the next level of throughput. And finally, you can move to a cluster architecture. So here we're showing a, a, uh, a vacuum, six-sided vacuum transfer module. We populate this with two load ports and four chambers. Uh, and then you would have four sputter modules and two load ports and a central robotic arm that would populate, uh, move the wafers from the, from the cassettes to the, to the individual sputter modules. So what, what does this give you? Uh, if we look at throughputs, we chose a process to explore the mechanical limits, mechanical limits only. This was a very short deposition process, 60 seconds, and we calculated the throughput you would achieve with these different architectures based on this very short uh, process. If you have a longer process, of course, your throughput is much lower. But this gives you a, a good uh, example of the limits of these four different architectures. So first, no load port, vent for each wafer change. You can do that in about an hour for typical sputtering pressures. Uh, so vent, change, pump down, run, uh, and then uh, you do about one per hour, 7,500 wafers per year if you ran three shifts, which no, in fact nobody would. This was, would be more useful in a lab. When you go to a single chamber, single wafer load port, you can do about three wafers per hour or 23,000 wafers per year for a single process. Again, this is mechanical limits. So you can see you get quite a bit of, of bang for the buck there, uh, three times the productivity. Uh, and you're not venting your chamber very much. When we go to the single chamber cassette load port and pumping down once every 25 wafers, you get a, another increase of about to eightfold to about 24 wafers per hour or 185,000 wafers per year. This kind of architecture is actually getting relevant to, to medium to large volume production. Uh, so in a large fab, you may see systems that are running with uh, cassette load ports particularly for longer processes that will run overnight or, uh, and it becomes a, a good productivity tool. Uh, and finally, the four chamber load port vacuum transfer module. This one, four times the modules, you can get 10 times the wafers per hour, about 250 wafers per hour or 2 million per year. So for paying four times as much, you get 10 times the productivity. So that's really a, a huge advantage in productivity should you have that much demand. So this is our toolbox that we're going to be choosing from.
again, the standard sputter module that was used with all front end options, what's the advantage of using the same module? Well, for one, regardless of your pr uh, production level, you're going to get the same consistent repeatable process performance, whether you're doing one wafer per day or, or one wafer per minute. You're going to achieve the same process results. So when you, you buy that module, you, it doesn't matter what your throughput is, you're going to achieve the same specifications. You're going to have the same optimized configuration. You can put the right, the right in-situ controls and leverage those, use those across multiple applications with this same module. Uh, and then once you have nailed down the, the controls you need and you can transport that, should, you're up, should you need more throughput, you can put that to a faster front-end option when your production volume increases. So you won't affect the process performance, but you'll increase your throughput so you have a very scalable solution. And this is one of the key reasons Magnetron sputtering is so scalable. You can use the same process module at both very low and very high volumes and achieve the same results. So now let's go through our example applications. First, we'll talk about our... our uh, infrared imaging systems. So what we're doing here, we have this customer who needs to add indium bumps to a focal plane array. This is, again, a low-volume manufacturing uh, operation. So focal plane arrays for IR imaging systems are moving to higher and higher pixel density. So you want smaller devices with more resolution. The focal plane array itself needs to be bonded to a CMOS integrated circuit to read out the individual pixels on that array. Uh, and that's done by a matching an array of indium solder bumps uh, between the IC and the FPA. Traditionally, they've used plating, but that doesn't work for the latest feature sizes and pitches. We're now talking about uh, this, this example um, micrograph I have here. These are four micron bumps, four microns wide, four microns high, and 10 micron pitch. And plating just doesn't work at these really small feature sizes and pitches. It really requires vacuum deposition. So let's work through this example. What are the thin film requirements for this low volume manufacturing process? Well, this is a liftoff process. So we need a, a, something that's compatible with liftoff. So that's one of our uh, requirements. Two, we're going to need uniform bump heights. Uh, if you're bonding an array like that, you can't have different heights. You'll end up with, with open open circuits and some pixels will be dead. You'll need something that gives you good liftoff yield. So again, you need liftoff capability as well as good yield. You want these bumps to be uh, well-formed and identical everywhere. And you want a repeatable process. Everybody wants a repeatable process. So th these are the requirements that, that the customer gave us. So that translates to us to a system requirement of a, a system that produces a highly collimated beam for liftoff low defect count per wafer so we don't get uh, so we get good yield and something that's appropriate for a few wafers per day this is a pilot production uh, emerging from r d uh, in pilot production and they're not selling very many of these now but they, they expect to in the future but right now it's a low volume application so how do we go through our system system creation so we identify the critical film and system characteristics so liftoff is critical repeatability is critical, and uniform small bumps. This micrograph is what everybody's looking for. So we're able to achieve this. We want a system that does that repeatably and reliably. So we match our film characteristics that we identified with the technology and the configuration that we discussed in the previous section of the webinar. So what do you need? You need a long throw thermal evaporation. These bumps are indium, low melting point of 157 degrees centigrade, so thermal evaporation works well. Long throw gives you a collimated beam, which is what you need for liftoff. So that's the architecture that we're going to do, and that's suitable for low volume production. So that matches the production need, and we're not paying for more capability than we need. Uh, as far as repeatability is concerned, the only real option we have is, is quartz crystal monitor, QCM. Uh, because indium is opaque, so we couldn't use an optical monitor if we wanted. However, this does give you the repeatability you need uh, in order to achieve good bump bonding between the FPA and the, the CMOS integrated circuit. And the final characteristic we need for uniform small bumps and liftoff yield 
is a cryogenic chuck. We actually need to deposit these at very low temperatures because with the low melting point of indium, if we did it at room temperature, it's too close to the melting point and indium being very soft is very mobile. The indium will migrate to the sides of the photoresist that's giving us the, the nice bump shape and will give you bad liftoff. <coughs> so since the good liftoff yield is critical uh, and the bump size and uniformity is critical, that cryogenic chuck turned out to be a key enabling technology for this particularly lo low volume application. And the fact that it takes a while to cool down the, the wafer doesn't matter because it's within our throughput budget. So now let's look at a medium volume application. This customer came to us, this is a diode laser manufacturer. They manufacture a large number of diodes for different markets. And uh, generally, the tool needs to run all day at, um, call it uh, tens, of, tens of batches per day. So I've given you here an example of, of uh, a manufacturing flow for diode lasers. There's a number of thin film deposition steps. Uh, I'm only going to discuss one that this particular customer came, for us, came to us with, and that's depositing what we call the ARHR step. Uh, on the, on the uh, laser diode itself. A laser requires a high reflector on the back side and a partial reflector on the front side where the light is coupled out, and that gives you your resonant cavity and gives you your coherent laser light out. So depositing those coatings is done with thin film deposition technology, and that's a multi-layer optical stack typically. So that's the coating that we're going to be discussing on the next slide. So what was the challenge here that the customer brought to us? Uh, one, on the thin film, the coating, the optical requirements were not particularly challenging, a relatively broad spe specification on those optical properties. So we don't need to get too carried away with, with, uh, with, with how to specify those films. Uh, we do need to withstand laser damage. So we want a high threshold of laser damage. So high quality, high density films is very important for that. And we want to be able to coat both facets without removing the diode array from the fixture. So we have to package these in a fixture, uh, flip it over somehow, and coat, um, and, and coat both sides before and after the flip. So that's a, a key technology for both preventing contamination and preventing uh, redundant work. So it goes to throughput and cost of ownership of the overall system. System requirements were a bit challenging. Uh, they needed a flexible design for both legacy and new products. And th these have different wafer sizes, so they needed to accommodate a large number of different wafer sizes, a large number of different form factors, but they wanted a low switching time between them. And for the legacy products, we needed to match the process of record, which is RF sputtering. These diodes were going into uh, subsea telecom laser amplifiers. They have very long lives. Uh, undersea, it's very expensive to replace them, so the reliability qualification is very extensive. So you want to match your process of record as much as possible so you can show similarity and do accelerated testing, and this gets your products into the field faster. So when you look at the return on, the, the, the return on investment, uh, that qualification time is a key component for, for this particular customer. So how do we go about getting a, uh, coming up with a solution for them? First, we identify the critical film and system characteristics. They need good yield, uniformity. They need good cost of ownership, repeatability, throughput, the right throughput, this medium volume throughput. Small footprint, this was a very tight fab. High uptime and a compelling cost of ownership. Oh, and by the way, they wanted a low cost solution because this was replacing an existing set of, of uh, equipment and they didn't want to pay for brand new equipment to enable something new, and they, they had a limited, relatively limited budget. So how do we go about choosing a system? We match the film characteristics and the system characteristics with our technology and configuration options. So this we ended up with a multi-cathode batch RF sputter module, not like the one I showed you, which is a single wafer sputter module. This is a batch module with a cassette load lock to populate the entire batch one at a time. We came up with a fixture design that was open on both sides so that uh, they could flip it 
Originally, we had talked about doing it in vacuum on a separate module using a central wafer handler, but since the cost driver um, was there, we had to move to the cassette load lock, and they have to take it out, flip it inside in a clean hood. They don't get contamination, but there's an extra step, but it's very fast to flip these cassettes uh, in, in manually one at a time, and they're able to keep this, the system uh, active and fully running uh, full time. And then for the uh, repeatability, as I mentioned, the relatively broad specs on optical properties, we use time and power control for the optical thickness. With sputtering, it's very repeatable through, time and, through target life. Time and power gives you good, consistent uh, thickness control, and it was good enough in this case that they didn't need to pay for an optical monitor system because of the limited um, specification requirements. So we came up with this batch tool with a cassette load lock and no OMS. It matched their footprint, it matched their cost targets, and they were able to move forward with that. With RF sputtering so that they were able to minimize their qualification time. So now let's look at a high volume application, RF power transistors. Uh, this customer, uh, RF power amplifiers are used in multiple high volume applications. Cable TV was one of the drivers. Cell phones is a huge consumer of these. There's multiple amplifiers per handset, uh, um, one corresponding to each of the various cellular bands in your, in your phone. There's a lot of phones made. Uh, up and coming is 5G, the next transition, the fifth generation uh, cell, cellular communication. That's driving new requirements both at the film level and the production levels because there'll be more RF bands, larger bands, higher frequencies higher spectral densities, it's putting a lot of demand on uh, power transistors and filters. But in 5G, it's a consumer application. Device cost is the most important factor. So you need a high volume wafer-based production solution. And what, we, what this customer came to us to discuss was depositing these gate stacks. But the source and the drain for this transistor is uh, Thai Gold and then the gate is tie plat gold. The titanium is an adhesion layer, and then the gold is a conduction layer, as well as the platinum. So they wanted us to deposit that on their uh, power devices, which were grown previously. So what were the thin film requirements? One, we need good adhesion between the metal and the algan layer. Uh, if you don't have good adhesion, you're going to have low yield and um, poor device performance. Two, we need two or three layers without breaking vacuum. You can't have any oxygen or contamination between the titanium and the, and the next layer. That's an adhesion layer, so you don't want any oxygen in there. Again, that would give you poor adhesion. Uh, you need reasonably uniform coverage. These, you don't have particularly tight uh, requirements on, on uniformity, plus or minus 5% over a standard wafer, 8-inch wafer, is, is good enough. The performance of the, of the stacks doesn't vary very much with, with thickness, so 5% uniformity gives you very repeatable electrical results. And then we want good repeatability from wafer to wafer. On the system side, we need high throughput, compact footprint, high uptime, and low cost of ownership. This is going to the 24-7 operation. Um, has to meet their throughput for this factory, needs to be compact, these are going in clean rooms, it's very expensive uh, space, high uptime, they don't want, they want productive tools, not tools that require a lot of work, so it needs to be producing at least 85% of the time, and we want the lowest cost of ownership. Uh, that's a larger factor for this customer than the cost of the system. They still care about the cost of the system, but the cost of ownership is really the stronger driver for this system, for this customer. So we went and identified the critical film and system characteristics. So the uniformity, we wanted plus, something that was suitable for plus or minus 5%, not something that was suitable for plus or minus 1%. The right repeatability, throughput, footprint, uptime, and the overall cost of ownership. Something that guaranteed the su sufficient adhesion and do that at the lowest cost consistent with the other requirements because everybody still cares about cost. As I mentioned in the beginning, the, the declining CapEx budgets means that's always going to be a constraint. 
So then we match our film and system characteristics with the with the with the technology and configuration op op options, and we came up with a four spot spotter module cluster architecture. So in this case, we used one titanium adhesion layer module, feeding two gold and platinum modules. Um, the titanium layer is very thin, it's a very fast process, and the gold and platinum is a bit slower, so one titanium module can keep up and keep feeding the two gold and platinum modules and keep them running 100% of the time so that they become the limiting step, and that really optimizes the, the cluster tool throughput. The fourth module they didn't actually need for this to meet their throughput requirements, but it's available. So they were able to use this for a, a separate high precision application, which they didn't purchase at, when they bought the cluster due to, to CapEx constraints. But the plan is to use that later for a thin film resistor or a bulk acoustic wave module. Uh, they already have the installation space reserved. They already have the slot on the front end. They won't need to pay for another front end and they'll be able to slide this module in at a later time when the CapEx is available because they planned for it in advance. So we were able to come up with this layout, which I'll show you for this customer, which is, it should be a little more clear to those of you who aren't familiar with cluster architectures. So this is our four module dual cassette module. And in the front or on the bottom, you see the two, two load ports. You put, there's always one under vacuum. And the robot in the center is feeding wafers out of one load port into the titanium module. After that fast deposition, it moves to the platinum module if necessary, or goes straight to the gold. And then it, it will take it from the gold module and put it back in the uh, cassette elevator. And when you've run through all those wafers, you invent that and move that on to the next process step while the robot is processing the other cassette. So there's never a set of new wafers not under vacuum and ready for processing. And in the future, when they add this BAW module with advanced process control on the right, they'll be able to put a cassette of uh, those devices in and deposit there uh, while the uh, other cassette is, is processing the titanium, the platinum, and the gold uh, gate stacks. So they're able to get multiple applications for a minimum cost. So they've really, really done a good job of leveraging their infrastructure, existing uh, footprint, and free facet on this, on this cluster architecture in order to get both the current capacity they need and the future capacity that they're going to want when they get to the next level of production on these BAW devices. So those are our three examples. Uh, please, if you have questions, you can ask them and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. Uh, but for now, I'd like to move on for my my last topic that, that I want to discuss is some more considerations for process equipment along the lines of what we just discussed. So just to summarize some of the themes that were there, what are the advantages of application-specific process equipment uh, versus hardware-specific process equipment? And we've discussed application-specific hardware only so far. Uh, and what are the implications of that for your factory return on investment versus looking only at a tool return on investment? So when we compare hardware-specific configurations versus application-specific configurations, what do I mean by that? Uh, so a hardware-specific configuration, many engineers, particularly at the early stages of research and development or early production, will specify the hardware first. So they'll tell you what deposition technology they want to use, what, how many sources they want, uh, what fixturing they want, what um, in situ controls they want, and the vendor is viewed as an integrator. They'll shop the same hardware spec to multiple integrators, multiple vendors, and often go with the lowest cost or the one with the best service or who, who happens to be the closest or whatever reason. But it's not about the process, it's about the hardware. This will give you functional hardware. The, the system integrator, the vendor will provide the hardware to meet your specs but won't have any really um, insight into how the tool really needs to work. That's really up to you. And as again, again, as I said, in R&D, early pilot production, that's perfectly fine. As you get more advanced, let's look at application-specific configurations, which is what I gave you three examples of. These were examples of configurations that are designed to meet the specific application requirements, and we're able to leverage those across multiple customers. So, 
Carefully selected capital equipment vendors have experience with the same application across multiple vendors. So those Indian bumps, for example, we have eight different customers that, that are using a very similar tool. And we're able to leverage that, that, uh, that knowledge of those different configurations without revealing any proprietary or confidential information and use our knowledge to provide a, a, a system configuration that we know is going to work for their application. In that case, the vendor is viewed as a collaboration partner with a standard product addressing the key requirements. So we get those bumps through a standard process. We get those laser facets through a standard process, and we have the system capability that's already designed to do that. And you get that when you specify the film requirements first and not the hardware requirements. That allows you and your customers to benefit from your vendor's experience in the industry across multiple customers. And the result then is a working production process. So this is going to get you into production much faster than if you specify the hardware and not the process. And then lastly, for factory return on investment, uh, remember that in these applications, each factory requires just a small number of tools for most process steps. You're not, this is not big semi with large multiple fabs. Uh, each process step has a few number of tools. If you specify different vendors for each step, it may make sense at the film level when you're looking at, at the, the film ROI. If vendor A is perceived as the best at optical coatings while B is best at metallization, mixing those tools might give you the best films in, in each case. Uh, what does that mean for you as, as, a, uh, as a factory owner? It means you're completely responsible for the entire manufacturing process flow. Vendor A and B will not have any particular insight in how the tools need to fit together. If you partner with a few vendors, the fewest number possible, then each individual vendor will have better understanding of the factory requirements and the overall manufacturing process flow. That means you're going to get better integration into manufacture and faster production qualification. Uh, you'll get a better service response because each vendor will have a larger install base and will be able to support um, servicing those tools at a much higher level, which is what's required as you go to higher and higher production levels. And since the tools, there's fewer tools, they'll have a, uh, tool vendors, they'll have a similar look and feel, and your operators will be familiar with the GUI, and you'll have uh, lower training costs. And this is going to re result in a higher factory uptime, as well as a, a faster time to production qualification, and minimizing your, uh, uh, maximizing your overall factory return on investment. So to maximize your factory ROI, uh, first, you do need to choose the process technology that best meets your production requirements. Um, so first and foremost, it's about the process technology, both, both at the film level and the production level. Second, don't buy more capability than you need just because it's better. The uh, laser facet medium um, throughput example, we did not try and sell them an OMS because they did not need that capability. The time and power was sufficient, and they would have wasted their, their precious CapEx dollars on something that was useless. So make sure you get the right capability, both for now and in the future, but not too far in the future. And don't buy less capability than you need just because it is cheaper. You've got to calculate the cost of ownership as well as the CapEx. So in our high-volume example, the customer could have bought less capability with a different architecture, but having that open facet for that bomb module in the future was a real advantage for them. They paid a little more, but they got the capability they needed to future-proof. So make sure you have your production needs for now and in the reasonably near future as well in mind, and, and spend your CapEx very wisely. Uh, and also do partner with the fewest number of carefully selected vendors to improve your overall factory uptime and your time to market. Well, thank you, David. That was an excellent presen presentation. I was uh, riveted throughout the entire thing. I appreciate your deep, deep dive on this very important subject. Uh, uh, we want to go to uh, some listener questions now at this particular point. And uh, when should I use optical monitoring systems versus quartz crystal monitoring? 
Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so there's um, optical monitoring is used. First of all, the films need to be optically transparent, or you can't use an optical monitoring system. Uh, second of all, you are going to tend to use them in an evaporation system. Uh, in sputtering, you would tend to use um, time and power versus an optical monitoring system. Some people do use quartz crystal monitor, but it's a little difficult. But the, the main driver is really about the precision of the optical films. So if you have a very narrow bandwidth, uh, bandpass filter or notch filter, and you need it precisely controlled on a wavelength or an edge filter, anywhere where you need that really precise control of the, the wavelength edges in your filters, that's really where the OMS is going to pay for itself in yield. Uh, otherwise, the, the quartz crystal monitor is probably a, a, a more cost-effective uh, control. Okay. okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, uh, David, would you say that there's a uh, substantial difference? I mean, looking at the uh, various front-end options that we have for thin film deposition, uh, is there a, a difference in the ease of installation between those front-end options? Uh, so with, with the four front-end options that we outlined, no front-end, the single wafer slider, or the cassette elevator, or the cluster architecture, so really between the first three, there's absolutely none. Uh, the tool is ready when it leaves the factory. It has the same footprint, essentially, uh, and gets installed uh, in, this, in the same amount of time. Uh, the cluster is a bit more complex. Uh, it's larger. It has more facility requirements, and the, however... Uh, it's still not much worse because you're prepared for it, and it leaves the factory fully tested, uh, so it's integrated and then, and then tested in the factory. So when it arrives, it's a very quick quick installation in any case, uh, just a little more prep work for the, the, the larger clean room space and the uh, utilities. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, David, also, uh, we're getting a few questions about uh, various process controls, uh, and uh, one of them uh, addresses the issue of in situ control, and which uh, would you say is uh, best for improving overall process control? Well, that's actually very similar to the last question on the, uh, the, the quartz crystal monitor versus the um, optical monitoring, so it's when you really need it. You don't want to pay for something that you don't, you don't need. Uh, so if you, if you don't have those tight requirements on the, on the optical properties, it doesn't make sense to use an OMS. So there's no real better per se. It's just we, we need to make sure we're, we're choosing the right in situ controls for the application in question. All righty. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, uh, looking over at uh, the uh, issue of monitoring again, uh, one uh, question we have that came in is, PIM, plasma emission monitor approach, uh, uh, better with higher or lower throughput requirements? Is there any um, uh, situation where you'd say you'd use one more than the other? Yeah, so the, the main advantage of PEM, uh, the plasma emission monitor and control, is throughput. You get to use me near metal rates of sputtering, so that the sputtering rate itself is much higher with PEM than with uh, RF on a, an oxide target. So it's really, uh, really geared towards higher throughput systems. Uh, it's also a fun toy in R&D, a fun little thing to explore, and people do that um, in, at the university level, and then in, in pilot production, of course, as you're setting up for a high throughput application. But really, you want you really want to be focusing that on higher throughput applications. It's all about your footprint and your throughput per square foot, and and uh, how how much technical capability you have to to bring to the the problem at hand. Okay. Okay. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, another uh, question, and this one's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. I'm, I'm pretty much going to just read it to make sure that we get everything. So how uniform a sputtering system should I consider for a uniform coating on a 20 millimeter by 20 millimeter dielectric lens for a test chamber? Oh, that's a, that's a pretty detailed question there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, the real question is how many of these of these uh, test pieces do you want to put in at once? If it's simply one, uh, then then uh, 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters is pretty small, so you would not need a large area of uniformity. 
uh, a, you know, you could do that with a two-inch cathode. Uh, if you're trying to do a hundred of those at a time, then you need a much, much uh, more uniform source. So it's it's a little difficult to answer that uh, without understanding the the coding. But uh, in general, on a device, a, a, a couple of percent for a lens. Uh, gives you pretty good uh, performance over a, a reasonable wavelength range. So over your device, that, that kind of number, um, you know, within a, a, a percent or two, will give you pretty repeatable coding performance, um, except for like a notch filter, like I said. That you probably need more precision. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, David, it, it, and, and this is totally off the cuff here. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking that uh, uh, given the nature of this last question, of course, we capture the uh, uh, the, the uh, person who asked it, their email address and other information. Perhaps uh, you would consider addressing that in a bit more detail or offering a uh, uh, opportunity for the person who uh, asked it to uh, uh you know, contact you offline, and then maybe you all could have a one-to-one -one conversation as well, too, and get out some of those, you know, particulars that could be difficult to uh, get into at this format. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, uh, give you even more, uh, Dr. Stove. <laughs> uh, another question, really concerned about increasing yield, uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, they're asking, is in situ control best for that uh, overall? Again, we have to mate it with the process. There's, uh, without knowing the details of, of what the, sp the process is, it's a little difficult to answer that. Uh, the in-situ controls are all about increasing yield, but we, we have to understand where the yield loss can be. Uh, so if you have weak requirements on the thickness, you wouldn't want a good thickness control. If you have um, tight requirements on thickness or on optical performance, then, then you're going to want to use... Um, optical monitor or, or uh, at least QCM. But it really gets down to understanding the application and, and working through that, that, that matrix like we did in the three test cases. Okay, all right, excellent, excellent. Uh, next question coming up, uh, uh, again, a, a bit of a lengthy one, so we may have to go into part of this now and then part of it offline. Uh, this one uh, asks, uh, is the optical monitor available on a Denton Integrity? So I guess we've got a specific prod, uh, process and product question here. And is uh, the in situ uh, ellipsometer or, or ellipsometer, I'm sorry, um, uh, my screen's a little bit foggy here. I couldn't get all that. Uh, available on the in Integrity, and, and this particular person uh, has an application in uh, uh, infrared uh, anti-reflective coatings, and they need precise RI control. So which would be preferable in that application? Uh, the caller says, uh, I guess, uh, the latter. Well, uh, yes, we have optical monitor available on the Denton Integrity. Um, I don't want to get too detailed here, um, and I'll be happy to follow up with this one after offline. Um, Generally, the ellipsometry is is a is, is a difficult to put in production. It's a very uh, um, finicky, shall I say, uh, technique. Uh, the optical monitor is much more robust, I think, in a production setting. Um, there's there's only a few cases where we've done the in situ ellipsometry uh, because I, it's a little difficult to answer quickly. But uh, uh, I'll be happy to follow up with that one offline. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, we have a combination of uh, questions coming up from uh, someone who uh, who asked the same same person. I I think they uh, meant to put this all together, but it got split into two. They uh, uh, so what about sputtering fluorides? And then also you had mentioned uh, CMOS compatibility in the presentation. Uh, if you could consider those. Uh, sputtering. I was. Uh... I think I was a little expansive when I said that you can sputter any material. Yes, for uh, for compounds, you often selectively sputter one ion versus another, so it's you don't get uniform uh, films. Uh, so yes, I, I I did overstate the, uh, the universality of of some of the techniques there. Uh, CMOS compatibility that was referring to the indium bumps. Uh, you need to. Uh, I'm not sure I used the word compatibility, but I'm not sure, don't remember exactly what I said. But you you need to mate the FPA the the focal plane array with this this readout the IC readout. 
Uh, so that's where the indium bumps are used. So pixel by pixel, you're going from uh, a detector a diode to um, a transistor. I, I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, please, I'll be happy to follow up okay. uh, offline. All right. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, David, and we're seeing some other uh, uh, kind of follow-up questions to original questions come in. So uh, it sounds like that, yeah, they're, they're definitely going to have to look at some of these logs and dive in a bit more. Uh, we have one, though, uh, one uh, uh, listener wanted to know a little bit more about uh, ion beam sputtering and uh, just uh, a, a few more additional advantages uh, about this type of process. Uh, that's a, kind of a broad topic there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure where to So Ion beam sputtering, you start with an ion source and you sputter a target. So the ion source is coming in very monoenergetically at a target material. And then you get a beam from of target material that's fairly directional. That's It's sputtered off of the target at a, at a well-defined angle, and that beam is what's de deposited on your substrate. Now, inherently, it's, it's relatively small and monoenergetic, and so you get a, a very uniform energetic film, uh, and you have to use a planetary fixture to, to coat uniformly over a large surface, but you get very repeatable, um, very dense films uh, with very well-controlled properties. So it's slow, but very, uh, very high-quality, very high-density films. If this is a more specific question, again, I'll be happy to follow up. Okay, excellent, David. Thank you, thank you. Uh, David, we're uh, uh, just about out of time, uh, so I, I, I wanted to listen, to, or rather mention to any of our listeners who still had a question that we didn't get to today that uh, we definitely follow up uh, after a webinar is concluded. Uh, Dr. Douglas has consented to... Uh, uh, look at uh, some of these follow-up questions, and in some case, there's questions and questions of questions. <laughs> so uh, we have a very energetic listening group today, and thank you all very much for uh, listening to us. Uh, after the uh, webinar is available online, everyone who registered uh, will be reminded of the fact that it is available for replay. And for those who have registered but were not able to join us today, uh, everyone, uh, again, will get the message and the link. And uh, for those who did not have a chance to hear their question answered live today, we will be doing follow-ups after the fact. So uh, uh, please, before you sign off today, if you had any part of your question that you wanted to still convey, please try to do that uh, for us so we can kind of collect everything together at once and uh, get answers back to everyone as quickly as possible. Uh, again, many, many thanks to our friends at Denton Vacuum uh, for uh, discussing uh, uh, the considerations affecting thin film deposition in compound semiconductor manufacturing. And we look forward uh, uh, for you all joining us again in the future for a new webinar.